Hello and welcome to this presentation on using a logarithmic graph scale. Now I must say there are a lot of times when we're teaching courses and giving seminars and I'll say to people do you use the log scale on your graph and they look at me and what you're talking about you know they don't people aren't always familiar with what I'm talking about hopefully you are but hopefully I will give you some additional reasons for looking at your spectra with a log amplitude scale. Now it is true that the vast majority of vibration analysts out there always look at the linear graph scale and you know, if you're not quite sure what I mean by log and linear I'll explain by that in just a minute but it's also true that a lot of people believe well if I'm looking at my graph and there's little peaks down the bottom and if I can't really see them if they're not high enough in amplitude yet then well I don't care about them. If they're not big enough to appear on the linear scale, then they cannot be very important. Unfortunately, that is not the case. There are lots and lots of situations where the spectrum actually contains really useful information about your machine. The presence of sidebands and harmonics and resonances and all sorts of things. It is there, it's just you can't see it because of the linear scale. Yep, the linear scale is easier, but you hopefully will get into the habit of just toggling sometimes over to log, toggle back again, and you might be surprised what you see. So, what does the log scale do? The log scale helps you see very small peaks in the spectrum in the presence of large peaks. Now, if you're talking about signal processing, there's something called dynamic range, which enables the analyzer to measure really small vibration in the presence of larger vibration. And all modern analyzers do a fantastic job of that. The trouble is, we don't often end up looking at that vibration because we're using a linear scale. So, you know, normally on your spectrum scale, you have, you know, uh, you know one millimeter per second or, you know, 0.1 mil, uh, inches per second and then way up here 10 times higher on, on the scale will be 10 millimeters per second or 1 mil inches per second. You know, I hope I just said all that right. Well, what we will see in just a moment is that with our uh, logarithmic scale, the space on the y-axis between 1 millimeter per second and 10 takes up the same space as the vibration as the scale from 0.1 to 1, or the same sort of deal with, with inches per second. It, it shows us what's happening in the lower vibration while still letting you see the higher amplitude vibration. There should be a toggle button in your software that just lets you sort of press a button and it'll toggle the graph to log. It might toggle it to dB, and I'll explain that in just a second, and then it'll toggle it back to linear. So just in certain situations where you suspect bearing faults, where you suspect faults with the motor, where you suspect uh, that there may be resonance causing peaks to be amplified, and other situations, it's useful to do it. Now what I hope you just realized is that, well, couldn't those situations exist just about all the time? Yeah. Exactly. That's why I'd get in the habit of toggling to log very frequently. If you suspect anything's going on, toggle to log and take a quick look. You know, I worked in uh, the US for a company for six years and we looked at everything in log. We, we happen to use DBV, that's a different story, but, um, which I'll explain in just a second. But you get used to it after a while and it makes life much easier. You know, when, when I show you these log spectra in just a second, you'll notice that um, everything always fits on a log graph. So you can keep the same minimum and maximum scale all the time. It doesn't matter how much vibration there is or how little vibration there is, you'll always see it on the same scale. You can therefore very quickly look at a spectrum and tell what's going on without having to look across at the scale, oh, this is really you know, small vibration, it just doesn't work that way. So, and here is an example, you know, here is some vibration from a machine uh, and this is the log version of it. Now, this is, you know, this happens to have a high amplitude peak in it, which means on a linear scale that I don't get to see some of the lower amplitude peaks. But see these sidebands in here? You know, there is a peak just here, can't even see it there. There's peak just here, 
can't even see it there. And yes, I could use high resolution screen and make it the linear spectrum bigger, but you just you cannot tell that there's there are sidebands here and that there are these other peaks. You know, this to me looks like 1x sidebands. See the separation between these peaks here? There to there to there. There's there are 1x sidebands in that spectrum. That indicates the bearing fault. Look at that spectrum and tell me there's a bearing fault. You know, you just can't do it. So that's the beauty of a log scale. Notice that on the linear scale, I've used inches, uh, millimeters per second, but you know, it's the same deal with inches per second, of course. You know, one, two, three, four, five. It, they go up linearly. Here they go up logarithmically. 0 0.001. Point zero point zero one zero point one one ten. They take up all the same space on the screen. Hopefully, this demonstration will explain um, the benefits of linear and log, and what the difference, are, or the benefits of log, but the um, difference between them. Here we have the Eiffel Tower, a building, a man, and a mouse. And I've chosen those four things because roundabout. They have to be a pretty big mouse, I suppose. But, you know, the tower is ten times as big as the building, which is ten times as big as the person, which is ten times as big as the mouse. Now, on the one extreme, if I want to see the tower, I can see the building, and I can tell, oh, yeah, there is a little man next to it, and, oh, yeah, we can just see a mouse. You know, if I... If I you know, look at them all on the same scale. It is very difficult to tell. I mean, you have to really look closely. The way I've done this, um, you know, we can see the building and the man's getting bigger, the man's getting bigger, and then the mouse gets bigger. So, yep, sure enough, if you had a linear graph and you kept zooming and zooming and zooming, you would ultimately see that little peak down there, or a little mouse. Uh, you can see the man sitting there, you can see the building next to the man, and you can see the tower uh, next to the building. In a log scale, guess what happens? Now we are looking at a logarithmic scale. 0 0.1, 1, 10, 100. I can see the mouse, I can see the man, I can see the house or the building, and I can see the tower. You know, okay, you're not looking for mice and men and towers and buildings, but if these were sidebands or little harmonics or noise floor, you know, whatever it is, you can see them all on the same scale. Yeah, you have to get your head around the idea that you may see more peaks than you're familiar with. Well, not may, you will see more peaks than you're familiar with. But you know, the idea of vibration analysis is to look at those peaks and look for patterns. So we'll look at some examples in a second. First, just briefly to mention the dB scale. There's the math there if you're, if you're interested. But basically, rather than looking at it as, you know, 0 0.01, 0 0.1, 10, 100, we can do it in dB, uh, dB differences. In our world, a 6 dB difference means a doubling of the value. So if, if the vibration increased by 6 dB, it means it doubled in amplitude. If the vibration increased by 12 dB, then it increased by a factor of 4. And if the vibration increased by 18 dB, it means it increased by a factor of Eight. Oh, and, and here's an example. So there's the same data. I apologise, it's scaled just a little bit differently, but if you look closely, it's the same data. But here it's, you know, 0 0.001, 0 0.001, 0 uh, 0.1 and 1, and here it's just in VDB, just different values. And as I say, if you use VDB, scale your graphs from about maybe 120, 130 VDB down to about 60, you will always see all vibration. You, you know, the bottom is always the stuff that's really low vibration, but you'll see some sidebands and maybe some harmonics there. At the high end, you know, if there's really a lot of vibration, you'll see it. The point is, you can see harmonics and sidebands there that you'd miss otherwise. So, to recap, the log scale enables us to see the low amplitude peaks in the presence of high amplitudes. You will see harmonics and sidebands you missed before and um, you'll be able to tell whether peaks are being amplified because of resonance that you might have missed otherwise. And I'll, I'll give you some demonstrations. Just one little point on harmonics. You know, I've said that a few times. Harmonics are really useful if you're detecting bearing faults. You might see a peak and in a log scale much easier see that there are harmonics. 
But when it comes to like the 1x vibration, the harmonics can be misleading. When you look at a log scale in a spectrum and see 1x harmonics, you could say, whoa, looseness, look at, look at all those harmonics. If you switch back to linear, you might notice that those harmonics are very small. So you'll suddenly say, oh, not looseness. You might go back to balancing, uh, uh, unbalance or you know, misalignment or something. Um, so just, it is helpful to look at both until you're really familiar with the log scale. So here, I think I showed this example before. You know, here's vibration, um, but there are sidebands both you know, these small sidebands here which could be pole pass sidebands and these other sidebands in here which you know, look like if I space my finger you know, for the 1x vibration, 1x difference in frequency and then move them on these peaks I can see that they are 1x peaks. In this case, um, yeah in the linear graph I can see that the noise floor is raised in a couple of places but when I switch to log not only do I see these peaks that I didn't see before and um, but I can, I can really see how the noise floor has raised up in certain areas in the graph. Do you see that? And that would suggest to me that there may be a resonance in here, you know, natural frequency being excited, and this peak may have be higher in amplitude because of that. I can draw that conclusion from here, but it's much more clear by looking at this spectrum. In this case, again, you know, yes, I can see the noise floor has raised there, but it's much more obvious uh, here and here. I can really see that um, something's causing the noise floor to raise. I can see these peaks out here, maybe with some sidebands. It's just rubbish there. Now, you may argue, well, it's so small, who cares? But it can be a sign of, of faults. And this is one of the important points. When you diagnosing bearing defects um, you know we go to all this effort and you know use peak view and enveloping and all that and they are great techniques and normally when we teach how to diagnose bearing faults we will often say um, you need to use those techniques because you won't see changes in the velocity spectrum until maybe stage three bearing fault until you know it's really developed well to be truthful we're only saying that because people look at the linear, the velocity spectrum in linear, and therefore it's impossible to tell. The fact is that we've been using log scales for years and detecting bearing faults quite early with that log scale. It's important to have a higher F max as well, so that you can see the harmonics. Uh, it's important to have an analyzer with a good dynamic range that can pick up that low amplitude vibration in the presence of the higher amplitude. But hey. All the modern analyzers can do that. So with the log spectrum, um, suddenly from a spectrum that's kind of boring, you know, we could spend a bit of time on this, but I can tell you that there are sidebands through there and harmonics in there that indicate a bearing fault. Where is it here? Now, you could also argue, well, if this machine didn't have, you know, a high 1x and 2x peak, the linear scale would be lower and I might see this stuff might, could have, would have, maybe, you know, the fact is you've got a problem with this machine but you've actually got two problems and one of them is that there's a bearing defect here, probably caused by the other problem you've got. Okay, so the log scale will reveal the faults. So, um, bottom line is find out what that toggle button is in your software. It shouldn't, shouldn't have to go up into menus and choose log. There should be a shortcut key on your keyboard. The fact is that um, you just might be surprised. I'll take away the word might. You'll be surprised what you see in the log spectrum. Um, if there are signs of bearing where you could look uh, toggle to log. If the base of the peaks appear a bit broader than you expect or they're lifting up a bit more than you expect, toggle to log and see what's going on. If there are really high amplitude peaks, toggle to log because those high amplitude peaks are pushing your linear scale up, which means you can't see what's down the bottom. Toggle to log. Um, if you see little small peaks there and you think, oh, what are they? Toggle to log. Um, and, you know, just generally, if you suspect bearing faults, motor faults, resonance, you know, and the list actually does go on, uh, detect, uh, toggle to log. And if you uh, want to see if there are sidebands in there, 
toggle to log. So I've said toggle to log a lot of times, find out what the key is, try it out, you, you'll become more and more familiar with it and you'll be uh, very glad you did. Anyway, I hope this presentation has been useful. Thanks for viewing it.